Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second edition of On the Park Bench. I'm Lynn Richards, uh, and I want to welcome you to uh, today's conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. Um, On the Park Bench represents an interactive conversations with thought leaders throughout the new urbanist movement and allied industries, providing an opportunity for us to engage in real time. Um, we felt as an organization and a movement, we really needed to provide a platform for members to engage on how the coronavirus and the corresponding economic downturn was affecting us as a movement, our individual firms, and how we move forward. Um, we are intending this to be a weekly webinar, um, again, to provide a platform. And today's conversation, we're going to hear from Victor Dover, Kim Delaney, and Dana Little about virtual public engagement, a new approach to charrettes. Now, um, I was talking to Victor a couple of weeks ago, and he has been working on moving his online, moving public engagement to more online. Um, the idea is how do we get more inclusive engagement in charrettes? It also happens to be the tool that we need to be using now. Victor Dover, for those of you who don't know, is the principal in charge of Dover Cole and Partners Design and Planning Projects. He's been a longtime CNU member. He was there at the very beginning, board chair, and a good friend of mine. Um, thank you, Victor, so much for being here today. Kim Delaney is the Director of Strategic Development and Policy at the Treasure Coast Regional Planning, uh, Regional Planning Council. When Victor and I were talking about this, he said, oh my gosh, we absolutely have to have Kim because they are completing a virtual charrette process just this week. And Dana Little is the Urban Design Director at the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. He has nearly 30 years of experience in the fields of city planning, urban design, architectural design projects throughout the U.S. and Canada. So with that, I want to remind everyone that when to, an, to ask Q&A, go to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a little Q&A button um, and to send those. Each speaker will be speaking for, for about 10 minutes and then we're going to try to answer as many questions as possible. And as always, we will put a recorded uh, version of this webinar up on our website within the next 24 hours. So Victor, it's all you. How's that? Thank you, Lynn. Can you hear me? Looks like Lynn is muted, so I'm going to assume you can hear me. Just give me a nod if that's a yes. All right, a thumbs up. Very good. All right, well, thanks, everybody, for joining in. I, I think this is a really, really cool time to stop and put our pencils down and gather as a family and talk about how we're making these adjustments and uh, how, we, how we fit them in with our, within our CNU traditions and advance the new urbanism despite the great pause and delay that uh, is going on all around us. So I want to uh, just share my screen and I'm going to uh, bring up um, a few images to show you. I think you probably still see my shiny face here uh, in the Brady Bunch view while we're doing that. And I will get it over. It started and I, now, Lynn, give me another thumbs up if you can see that image nice and clear. And if not, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Yeah, Victor, it's in presenter view. You need to do that funky. Yeah, right. there you go. And there, there you go. Good job. There. All right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, sure. The, uh, first of all, there's, uh, there's, I think I have to start by reminding everybody that there's a great tradition within CNU. And that's that we uh, share discoveries and we, we test outcomes and we share the outcomes of those tests. Uh, we hone techniques. That was the original idea behind convening the CNU. Was a lot of people were calling themselves new urbanists. We thought, well, why don't we get together and show each other what we're doing and, uh, and build up the technique. Uh, and that's really unusual in movements, uh, movements of all, of all sorts, uh, movements within art, movements, uh, reform movements. Uh, lots of times the, the movements tend to become insular, a little bit more like a Pythagorean secret society that has its secret recipes and secret geometries and what have you. Um, but CNU has never been like that. And even though CNU had uh, founders that were architects, 
uh, most architects kind of work by themselves in their offices and they rarely go show one another their, all their best techniques and so on. Uh, so CNU uh, is not at all like architects uh, generally in that respect. Uh, and I think that's a good thing to remember in light of the times that we're in because now we're ordered into our houses. We are trying to keep our distance. At the same time, we're staring at our screens and we're trying to draw closer, literally draw closer, even though we're sitting farther apart. Um, and that's, uh, so that's the timing of all this. Now, my premise is that we don't have to stop collaborating or uh, in planning decisions or engaging the public, uh, stop doing interactive things with our clients just because of the timing. We could, if we use the amazing array of digital tools that are avail available to us now, we could move more of the process online. And that's what I wanna talk about here. Um, for example, we can stage virtual charrettes or online design weeks, also known as virtual charrettes. I don't know if that term will stick or not, more on that in a minute. Uh, this is a way of combining quick online collaboration, uh, lets us you know, use surveys and polls, build and compare scenarios, and then use video conferencing. I think all of that will give people something of a reprieve from uh, what, they're, what they're doing with watching the cable news all day, or worrying about the present. Uh, we, it's a great idea to, to give people an hour or a couple hours or a week with a few occasions during that week where they can turn that stuff off, uh, turn it, tune in to what we're doing in an online design week and think about the future. And if we make the most of it, you know, we can use this time to re-educate. We can decide what we want our communities to be when they grow up. Uh, and I don't think that's really a new thing. I think that's a lot like the rapid prototyping and feedback process that industrial designers have been using for a long time. It's like the test screenings that filmmakers use. We're just using those things for city planning. Now, why do, uh, I get the question a lot, right? Why do you think we should go ahead and do all this planning? Uh, why now? Why not wait? So I'll make a comment about that. Um, right now, you know, getting together uh, to talk about our community's future and do civic engagement is that reprieve. But I think more importantly is that sometime really soon, we're going to be ready to go back into public meetings. We're going to be together in important decision making. In fact, there's going to be a lot of pent up decision making to do uh, in projects that have been stalled in, uh, in rethinking. There's, uh, we're going to need to, to go out and, and help rebuild our local and global economies fast and better. Uh, that means there's going to be a lot to do. And the more ready we are, the better we can do it. I also think that people will will find, as they're finding now, you know, walking and biking on streets that they once thought were just for cars, uh, that they're going to have a rekindled interest in public space. And that is the new urbanist thing. We know how to talk about public space, how to draw pictures of it and help people choose what they want uh, those to be like. So if you're thinking city management, infrastructure, um, real estate, all these have got to come together fast uh, in that rebuilding phase and be better than before. Uh, that means we need strategies for pulling together. So this is the right time to be doing this. Let's get extra ready. Now, it's not that unusual for us to go out and look for feedback on work in progress on planning. Uh, some of you probably use keypad polling in public meetings or you pass out surveys um, or you ask people to fill out cards or you do a show of hands. But some way or another, you're asking uh, the, the body that gathers when you invite them into the planning process what they think about certain things. And of course, the more electronic that has become, the more natural it will be to move it online. One thing to think about if uh, my friend Bill Lennertz from the National Surrette Institute uh, is on the call, he'll remind me that uh, to tell people that the online design week or the virtual charrette is just one part of a larger process, a longer timeline that includes getting ready, getting charrette ready, building uh, you know, background analysis, doing trial runs. And then after the charrette is over, it, the project is not over. There's a whole uh, assimilation synthesis phase to build the kinds of products that we come back to the clients with in the end. Uh, that's, so you got to remember that what we're talking about shifting to online was one part of a much bigger timeline. It doesn't eliminate the need for in-person meetings with some of the rest of it. Uh, now, why? Why now? <laughs> I will say this. For a long time, we felt that one of the original advantages of charrettes, which is that we 
took the process out of some secret plant back room in the planning agency or consultants offices and took it out into public, designed in public. Uh, we did that because that was the best way to execute on reforms, getting more people touching the plan, the best plan made by many hands. Uh, and so uh, we said, well, they're having a hard time coming to meeting after a meeting over the course of a year. Why don't we compress this stuff into a much faster and satisfying process? Now, we did that also for efficiency, not just for inclusiveness. And I'll come back to that uh, before we finish here. But lately, over the last few years, our, our citizen participants that we count on for a designing in public charrette to be successful are more and more time stressed. If they're younger and they're working down student loan debt or they're raising children, they have you know, working two jobs, they have a lot of demands on their time. And so uh, I think a lot of us who have been through the NIMBY wars know that uh, no per process is perfect, but the intensive in-person weeknight uh, kinds of meetings and things like that uh, really tend to be uh, convenient for some activist retirees and not a lot of others. In other words, uh, it's a sign that you might be doing your planning in an unhip sort of way if only angry old white people show up to your public meetings. And I think we've realized for a long time, we need a way to reach more people, uh, including those younger folks who are time stressed. And we need ways for, for people to give their input on a plan without having to necessarily be in the same room at exactly the same time. We need a way to make it asynchronous so that uh, someone who missed the, the presentation can watch it a few hours later or a few days later and still give their responses to the survey questions. Um, there's, a, there's a positive and a negative to this idea that we're going to convene in a historic moment in the life of your town. And um, the positive is, it's a historic moment in the life of your town. Don't miss it. The negative is, if you missed it, you missed it. And that is why we need another solution, an asynchronous way of collaborating that allow people to catch up, even if they're a few days late coming into it. So uh, I'm gonna show you some uh, screenshots that really have to do with uh, a couple of recent projects. One uh, for the Mullen area in Missoula, Montana. Uh, we were about to do a charrette and then the order to stay at home came and uh, travel shut down. And so over the course of just a week or two, we had to pivot and recast that big uh, public design and public charrette experience uh, as an online thing. And so we created a virtual charrette hub and invited people to uh, answer questions, gave them a schedule of what would happen day by day, did the daily pinups and uh, the feedback loop that we would typically stage for in-person charrettes. We did them with video presentations and video conferences uh, that we would, put up new questions each day as new information was also posted to the website and to YouTube. Uh, here's a screenshot of my colleague, Rob Pietkowski, uh, using a video conference presentation like the one we're in to present work underway. And then uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, in a different house, everybody working individually or sometimes in pairs if they're married. Um, you see Jason King was drawing a big plan and you know, frantically photographing it or making a video of it very, uh, low tech, quickly um, quickly posted, not slick, uh, presentations to show people what we had, and then convene the conversation over it. We managed to get a lot of live participants over the course of a week, about a, a thousand, which is remarkable. And when's the last time you had a thousand people come to your public charrette? We, we love to see it, but it hasn't happened very often. Uh, but we had uh, 20,000 uh, discrete media touch points through all the different uh, experiences online over the course of the week. So we're always doing technical work, like adding things up, but we don't usually get to show that, but this uh, until later. But this process allowed us to do it uh, interactively day by day as we went. And as the week unfolded, the groups got larger and larger, which was fun. Um, and the short presentations, like the one on the upper left, if you go to our YouTube channel, you can look at it or you can see it on the Mullen area masterplan.com uh, website. Uh, Pam Stacy uh, presented uh, her work on the on the third day, uh, explained in four minutes what was going on, a really uh, simple presentation. We got that idea from uh, earlier last year on the Panama City plan. Uh, 
Panama City was recovering from Hurricane Michael, still is, did a downtown plan for them. We needed to explain a lot of planning concepts really fast for time-stressed people. So we made short presentations. You see on the right side of your screen, they range from a couple minutes long to 30 seconds or 40 seconds each. And what that meant was that somebody could come watch these, uh, watch this little playlist on YouTube, and in about seven and a half minutes, could get a briefing on the entirety of the project. Uh, so what does a charrette schedule look like when you're trying to do an online charrette? Uh, it looks a lot like the traditional one. It's just that in-person technical stakeholder meetings with uh, invited people on special subjects are held as video conferences. Uh, we still have pinups, some more public, some for smaller groups at the end of each day so we can get feedback on the work as it's unfolding. Just do that online and with, and with video. Uh, and so we're about to do, uh, this is some funny screenshots from um, uh, one we're about to do for Neptune Beach, Florida. And they're doing a citywide plan, a vision plan that will precede their update their comp plan and their land development code. And uh, so this time we had a little more warning. So we started making explanatory, very short presentations um, in advance. So there's Louisa just explaining what's a virtual design charrette. You can go take a look at that and send me your cold hard critique on all this stuff. I want to just spend a second to talk about uh, some inherent limitations that come with uh, working online. Um, and there are not that many of them, but they're worth, um, they're worth considering, I think. Um, the, first of all, um, because of the limitations of working online, I want to say there, there's always going to be a place for in-person meetings. I don't think this is a, not presented, at least not by me, as a complete replacement for in-person anything. I mean, it's an add-on uh, in addition. One of those limitations is what I call the negative tendency of the internet. Um, we've all seen how if you're not looking folks in the eye when you say something or writing something to them, um, that might tend to bring out some of the worst aspects of human nature. And so there's a negativity that can come there. You know, people will write snarky comments, those can pile up. Um, and uh, you, you know, trolling happens, you know, Zoom bombing. All these things are possible, just like disruption at your public meetings in person are possible. And the answer to that is, of course, just like uh, uh, in your in-person meetings, um, use your tools. Now, what engagement tools do we use? This is a test, not these. <laughs> okay. I get this question all the time, like, which platform do you use? And the answer is we use a lot of different things, but don't focus on the platforms. That's like saying, what kind of Xerox machine do you have? Or what size uh, marker do you use to draw a plan? Um, I think <laughs> once upon a time, you would use CompuServe or AOL or MySpace to do things, uh, but don't focus on the tools. If you do, you're probably just, focusing on the next uh, AOL or, or MySpace. There are, that said, there are a lot of different platforms. Jennifer Hurley has pulled together a really beautiful uh, master list of this. And so uh, maybe she'll type it into the chat if she's listening. But uh, we are experimenting all the time with different ones. I've just basically come to the conclusion you cannot use a single uh, tool or platform. You need redundancy. You need a backups for every backup. Uh, you need a way if, if the computer craps out that you can continue on your phone. Uh, you need something low tech. If you look down that list, telephone town halls, cool thing. If you haven't ever done one, you should try it. They push a call to the people that have signed on and given you their phone number and joined your, your call list. Uh, they get a phone call, they answer the phone, they say hello, and, and the recording says, uh, we're about to start the telephone town hall and you'll hear from Dana Little and Kim Delaney, would you like to stay on the call? It's going to last 10 minutes. And then Kim and Dana can give her a briefing on what happened that day or what happened the next day. And the person on the other end does not have to operate a computer. They don't have to have broadband. They don't have to uh, know how to read maps. They you know, just listen for 10 minutes. They can uh, press the star key and ask a question. They can text a question in advance. Uh, Kim and Dana, if you did that, you would answer frequently asked questions. And in 10 minutes, you could catch people up. Instead of making them sit in an auditorium chair, or the folding chairs in the school cafeteria for two hours uh, to do the same thing. So I love the telephone town hall as an alternative. Now, as far as the limitations of the internet, uh, 
approach go? I've, I've run a little social experiment. Some of you probably figured out this is what I was doing. So now I'm going to come clean. Um, Lynn, you're giving me a chance to do a confessional with 450 of my closest friends. Um, it was an experiment. I've been, uh, every once in a while, I'll post a pretty little picture of the hashtag street of the day or hashtag storefront of the day um, or what have you. And, um, you know, each time I'd put, the, put one of those up, they'll draw a few likes, a few shares, a few complimentary comments, what have you. You can check them out, see what you think on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but every once in a while, I'll post a, a photo of something really ugly and terrible, a picture of a blank wall or um, a picture of sprawl or a really poorly designed and unsafe street with the hashtag what not to do. And what's interesting is every time I do that, well, that picture will get shared a lot more often. It'll gather a lot more comments. It'll gather a lot more likes or hates or tears uh, in the social media sites. And it's very interesting. I mean, people just are drawn to negative stuff uh, in social media. So I think we have, you know, we have to do our part to be part of the antidote to that. Um, the antidotes are pretty straightforward. I will um, just um, uh, stop with slides there and I'll, I'll uh, talk to you about it. I'm gonna stop sharing, come back to you as just me and my picture and you can see uh, each other. Um, first, the antidotes, you have to brief your participants uh, on constructive criticism rules that are gonna apply to your online collaboration space. Uh, you know, the kind of classic rules you would brief an audience about at the beginning of a hands-on session in a classic NCI system charrette. Um, one of those is build up ideas. Don't just tear other people's ideas down. You can tell us what you do like and, and tell us your solutions instead of just telling us what you see as problems. Uh, next, I think you have to give people lots of information. So we create a resources tab on the websites, uh, put a lot of information there, videos, old documents to read, uh, best practices links, things like that. Uh, and then we keep referring people back to those resources as questions arise. Remember, if you have a hot room, the antidote is information. Third, uh, there are plenty of nooks and crannies on the internet for anonymity. I'll say that again. There are plenty of nooks and crannies on the internet for anonymity, and this is not one of them. <laughs> so we say, you have to use your real name. When you, if you're going to make a comment or you're going to send in uh, recommendations or uh, you're going to uh, speak up in one of the video chats, we ask people to use their real names, just exactly like they would if they were going to City Hall and speaking at the city council meeting or they were going to the school cafeteria and speaking at your more uh, traditional public meeting. So that rule seems to help a whole lot. And then last, I would say, uh, for those who are wondering what you do when people start trolling or start writing, um, you know, the piling on the negative stuff, uh, we answer fast, right? respond fast, but just once. That's the rule, respond once. Um, you, you, you answer the questions, you clear up misinformation, but you don't get into an endless back and forth. Because if you try to do that, you'll get nothing else done the rest of your, of your week or your month. Now, um, I, just a little bit about inclusiveness. I think it's worth pausing to remember why we care about public engagement in the first place. Uh, you know, Jennifer Hurley, I mentioned before, uh, you know, says that uh, people who didn't seem all that worried about how few participated in the traditional in-person planning process now suddenly seem very concerned about who might get left out online. Um, but fair enough, but, but they are. I had a um, conversation with Megan O'Hara at UDA, our good colleagues in Pittsburgh. And she told me about a neighborhood with a lot of public housing where she's working, where uh, there's only 20% access to broadband. And the other 80% of the households don't have a computer or what have you. So I think the answer is you have to, your solutions to this are very place specific. And if you're doing a plan for a place, you, you're supposed to know about that place. So that might mean that in addition to staging online participation, you are also in contact with the barber or the pastor or the ministerial alliance or, whom, or the, the circle of mothers or whoever it is in that neighborhood that seems to have the inside story and know a lot of other people. In fact, they might bring people to your telephone town hall or invite when once people are allowed to come into one another's living rooms again, invite someone into their living room to participate uh, with one of the 20% that have broadband. Um, so that, I, th I don't want you to think that 
going online while distancing is the only problem. There's another whole side to this. Inclusiveness also requires building trust. A lot of people won't come to that school cafeteria or come to City Hall because they're intimidated by that setup. And if we can make the, uh, as, as Louisa was trying to do with the YouTube videos, if we can make the process friendly and seem accessible, then more people will uh, feel that bar of intimidation go down. It, you're, it's really about building trust. That's usually done in one-on-one -on -one conversations or in small groups. Uh, it relies on body language, on making eye contact with other people, hearing the tone of your voice. Uh, you know, you have to tell the truth over and over and then until people finally realize you are going to tell them the truth uh, and you have to do what you promised. So I guess what I'm getting at is trust won't magically emerge suddenly from doing an online engagement. It's going to be even harder uh, to do that. And Kim probably has some do's and don'ts about that as well. Uh, last, in the charrettes, you know, as designers, we think of them as an organic process. We didn't invent it for inclusiveness. That was a byproduct. We invented it for efficient collaboration. We wanted to get the plan done faster and have it be cooler because it, more people were able to touch it. But that also means that while you're working fast, uh, you are also operating an organic process, which is likely to surprise you. Um, you need to be able to pivot and change your mind uh, partway through about what you're going to do in the plan. So what I say is that's just the nature of a charrette. You might uh, you have an unpredictable plan. You can't promise that certain result is gonna come out of it because a great idea will come from this collaboration. You wanna incorporate it and adjust to it. But you need a very predictable calendar. Like, you know, Tuesday at six o'clock, we're having an open house and we're gonna put our pencils down and show everybody what we have so far. Friday night, we're gonna do a work in progress presentation. And you, the pressure of that deadline the being rigid about that and being loose about what the actual content is so that you can change and try things is how you make it organic. Uh, last comment about the times we're in. I think this is an, in, this, Dana will remember our early charrettes in the 1980s and 90s. Remember packing up that big truck? We weren't sure what to take. So we just took everything. We took every chair, every computer, every drawing board, every pencil we owned, every lamp. We weren't sure what we would need. We just took it all. Uh, on our early charrettes. I've got a great photograph of a younger Dana Little helping load the truck uh, for one of those. And, you know, that was a turning point in the history of the new urbanism because we would change the procedure so that we could get a better plan done. But we weren't sure what to call things or how, what to take. And over time, that settled down. I believe in the online public engagement, we are in a really similar moment when uh, we're trying, you know, this kind of survey or that kind of video or that this kind of video chat platform or this way of advertising it to get more participants. And some things will work and other things will not. Uh, the backups will start knowing what we can rely on. We can uh, just have one backup instead of backups for backups. So there's a lot of innovation going on right now and it feels a lot like the early days of charrettes for the new urbanism in the 1980s and 90s. They were a lot longer and a lot harder to do. Our first charrette in 1986 lasted five weeks. Um, was, uh, we didn't know how, how long we were supposed to make them. <laughs> and it was really hard, but uh, we finished. Um, I think we just barely scratched the surface. I'll make another comparison. In the beginning, we didn't know what to call form-based codes. Uh, in fact, a lot of people call them graphic codes or illustrated codes or typological codes, form codes, form-based zoning. Um, and in the beginning of the Form-Based Codes Institute, we, we had a little gathering and we talked about all the possibilities, uh, debated it, came out with form-based codes as our strange and new wonky term around which we would build the new tradition. And that's now kind of settled. We know what to call it now. Should we call what we're doing now, like I showed from Mullen or Neptune Beach, should we call it a virtual charrette? I have my doubts. I think in a, in a year or two, we're going to realize what we really should call it. Uh, right now, we're comparing it to charrettes because that's what we know. In the same way that Tylenol is compared to aspirin, you know, Tylenol is the non-aspirin pain reliever. Uh, when they wanted to explain movies to people, they called them motion pictures. <laughs> we, uh, when they wanted to explain cars to people, they called them horseless carriages. Or when they want to explain the next cars, they call them driverless cars, but even though they're really something else. So I'm just saying we are at a stage where we don't know what to call it exactly. We'll call it a virtual charrette this week, probably call it something else next week. But that's, that's a symbol of the innovation we should be in. So now's not the time to get rigid. 
know, now's the time to experiment a lot and to try a lot of things, uh, see what we can, uh, what we can make work, innovate, and show each other. Don't thank stop. You, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much um, to to Kim and Dana. We let Victor go a little bit longer than we had anticipated because he had um, he had just such good good information. Um, we're getting a lot of really good questions in. Um, if it's okay with the panelists, I expect that we'll go a little bit beyond one o'clock so we can answer all the questions. Um, and so, Kim, you're up next. Thanks so much. Sure. Uh, so, hey, good afternoon. Uh, Kim Delaney from Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. Um, one of the things I know is I always learn when Victor is presenting. And so I'm so grateful to have a chance to kind of look at the world a little bit through uh, through Victor's advanced uh, advanced focus. Um, uh, I'm hoping my screen is visible now. Can you give me a thumbs up, Lynn? Or Claire? Anybody? Great. Okay, super. So, um, so the um, the example that we're going to um, present is um, is a very specific one. We just finished up um, our first virtual design workshop with the city of Port St. Lucie, which is in uh, the region. Uh, the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council is four counties in southeast Florida, from Indian River County south to Palm Beach County, um, and so. Um, uh, and so our first design virtual design workshop was two weeks ago, just a little overview and then a couple lessons learned so that we can get the questions. Um, this happens to be uh, a master plan effort to look at look at some property that um, the city annexed about uh, 15 years ago. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, uh, uh, this is a city that's been through a lot of economic ups and downs. And so the idea of planning in a down market. Um, as a way to become competitively positioned uh, for recovery is one of the conversations we've been having with the city because we've all been anticipating there's going to be kind of a lull, right? Everyone has known um, the, the sine curve of the economic trend is, um, has been waiting to take a dip. Um, and so this is a city that's particularly sensitive to that. They've been through every dip and every time they've gone through one, they've been left with a pretty big financial obligation. Um, in this instance, um, this is an area that the city uh, was uh, busily annexing back in the early 2000s. The area that we're focused on is highlighted in the green. It's about 1,200 acres um, after two different owners um, and, uh, and two different uh, recovery efforts, let's say. The city took the land back with a negative $59 million um, infrastructure obligation uh, because, of, uh, uh, because of good decisions made at the time with the best available data. This is one of the conversations that you have with communities that inherit problems like this one. Um, prior master planning efforts um, had taken place. Uh, ULI came in twice in 2004 and as recently as last year with some different um, design suggestions. The city actually created a CRA, a community redevelopment area, um, on this vacant land, unprecedented in the state. Um, and so this area is part of a, a CRA and so it has a different financial circumstance, which is complex for the staff and complex for the community. Uh, the city has created a separate entity uh, the Port St. Lucie Governmental Finance Corporation. The area highlighted in orange is the 1,200 acres we're focused on. Part of the effort includes a demographic and market overview. It's a fast-growing city with the biggest message being, gosh, lots of people leave the city every day instead of coming into work. Um, and so with an export of workers on a daily commute basis, um, the idea of bringing in jobs in the quarter is high priority for the city. Um, as part of the background, work for the uh, uh, for the design workshop and the design effort that's underway, um, we've been helping the city develop GIS maps. We've been working collaboratively online in this last three weeks to update all of these. Um, one of the lessons taken away is it's a lot easier to work with a consistent set of background maps um, that um, uh, that can be shared electronically and quickly because we've been uh, we've been finding inconsistencies between the city's data and the information that we're uncovering and this effort is taking place while a third of the city's uh, um, a third of the city's staff is in city hall, um, and so we've actually been accelerating that work on behalf of the city. So when they get back to a regular um, design function, if you will, they'll have better background data. So it's a benefit I think that we're able to offer with um, with this effort moving quickly, um, even though there isn't the traditional face-to-face uh, -face interaction. Um, of the big things to note on this land, this is a design uh, challenge for them. The good soils happen to be along I-95, and so that's where we're working on some stormwater lakes in the master plan um, design, uh, uh, kind of uh, assembled into the graphic that's on the screen now. Um, so with respect to the design effort, 
Uh, the city led a public outreach process back in January um, with a regular public engagement uh, with uh, about 275 citizens that participated um, and provided input. Um, and so that prior input gave us the ability to advance into a virtual design workshop um, without concerns that the public wasn't suitably engaged. Um, I, the, some of the questions I was noticing as Victor was presenting was, you know, how do you confirm or how do you assure that you have equitable participation in a design process? We haven't hit that question yet, and I think it's a valid one, especially in that we're coming at this from a public agency perspective. Um, we simply had um, the benefit and the good fortune of a city-led effort that had really broad participation and generated a wide net of, um, uh, of public feedback online in the effort. So the public's already engaged in this opportunity, so we're able to move forward kind of quickly into design. Um, we ran a virtual design workshop two weeks ago. We had um, all of the city departments participating, not the public at this stage of the game. We had 22 participants. We simply scribed during that effort after we had a very detailed opening presentation. So we kept discussion notes from the staff input um, to utilize in the development of the master plan. Um, the types of um, the types of uh, design concepts that we're generating now focus on a biotech district, uh, which is illustrated on the, this first slide, uh, an infill town center concept, which is on the second slide, and a workplace district um, infill strategy, which is the third one. So uh, in a very specific instance, we're able to produce the type of work we normally would produce. What's important, though, for today's conversation is what are the lessons learned thus far? So I tried to pull these together just for the benefit of the webinar for today. Um, these are the kinds of things that we've seen um, from, the, from the facilitation standpoint. I'll walk through these, and I think Dana has some additional ones as well. So I ran the effort. Um, the, types of, uh, the types of takeaways, uh, knowing your team well makes a big difference in this environment. When we're in a traditional workshop setting, you get the benefit of eye contact, and just with a look, your colleague knows exactly how to step in and help. You don't have that benefit online, so there's a lot more pressure on you as the facilitator because you're really kind of blind. It's like being on stage with all the spotlights and really not a lot of ability to hand off where you need to. It's not as, uh, it's not as natural. Um, stay hydrated. Uh, the uh, design workshop we ran was scheduled for three hours. I thought it would run two. Instead, it ran four hours. Um, I should have had three gallons of water next to me at the uh, um, at the computer and scheduled bathroom breaks, just as a heads up. So in terms of, uh, you know, living life online now, um, the video world is a lot more tiring than being at the podium. I'm an extrovert, and so my energy comes from being with others. And so what I've learned in three weeks of telecommuting is I don't have the same energy levels I normally do because I'm not able to interact with people and feed from that. Um, the video uh, setting for design workshops is even more tiring. So um, uh, so just an observation as a facilitator, um, investing even more heavily in the opening presentation is going to be more important, I think, as we go forward. We have several virtual design workshops that we're going to be undertaking in the next few weeks. We would normally spend 50 hours on an opening presentation, you know, making sure it's really fine-tuned. In the, in the online environment, the opening presentation is even more important because you don't have as much latitude for Q&A like you normally would in a natural workshop setting. Um, and so that's an observation as one of the facilitators. Um, and then triple checking your formatting, because by the way, not everything on your computer screen always shows up exactly the way you expect it to. Um, for this exercise that we undertook, we always find it very easy to scribe during workshops. And so we actually inputted a series of discussion slides in the PowerPoint presentation so we could reach a point of closure, let everyone take a breath, and then literally scribe notes from the discussion. Um, that kept all of the participants engaged. And of course, in every one of these exercises, everyone wants to see their thoughts represented. So that was a very natural way to represent those thoughts. Um, what I have found in now three weeks of virtual meetings nonstop, um, I think people are very gracious. Elected officials are gracious. They're so appreciative that we're still working hard as facilitators, and in our case, as agency representatives or as private sector, um, uh, facilitators to keep these processes going. Nobody wants to lose momentum. And the, um, the public that we work with understands the best time to plan is in a down market. That's a message that we've carried over time. Um, when the inbox is so high, the planner can't see over the top of it, you can never get a master plan done. 
Um, and so um, there's a grace that we've been given in this time to carry these projects forward. Um, they, they expect there's going to be lag time in the presentation. Um, just from a, a housekeeping uh, a comment, send your, PDF, send your PowerPoint as a PDF early. What we find is that all of the different platforms are lagging now. And so if everyone has the PDF as well, then you have the ability to simply reference a slide while you're waiting for it to pop up and you don't need as much filler. <laughs> um, if you can, send your dogs and kid away um, or dogs and kids away um, because uh, a four hour virtual uh, workshop doesn't give you a lot of latitude to take care of the things you need to. Everyone is home with their dogs and their cats. I've never had as much fur on my keyboard as I have in this last three weeks. So, and then the other observation, just as an agency representative, um, I think I really do believe that the virtual environment will make for better democracy in the long run. Um, it's been easy to use a workshop format where you arrive in a city hall, um, residents participate, and maybe you get continued participation over time, but not in the same format that starting a process in a virtual environment will, uh, will guarantee. Um, the elected officials I've been speaking with are actually all becoming more knowledgeable. Most of them are not computer savvy, right? Um, and so they're building their skills Going forward, there's no reason we can't also include a virtual component to whatever workshop process we carry out. Um, we're all going to be more capable um, and more knowledgeable about how the, the interaction works. All of the cities are getting set up to, uh, to incorporate that. And so long term, I think this gives us an opportunity to have more public engagement, longer term public engagement, um, cutting across more demographic boundaries, um, and, um, and getting for more informed decisions uh, with more confidence when we get to the point where we make recommendations. So that's my little piece of optimism. I have to be an optimist because I work for the Regional Planning Council, so it's always going to get better. Um, and this is one of the takeaways that I have as a, as a facilitator. So I'll stop sharing my screen, but there's contact info for you for Dana and me. Um, and then, um, Dana, I think you had some additional lessons learned that you wanted to share. Yes, thank you, Kim. And thank you, Lynn and Margaret, for inviting me. Um, Wow, big turnout. I wasn't really expecting that. Um, yes, Kim and I are colleagues at the Regional Planning Council. She's eternally optimistic and I am her counterbalance to that. Um, I don't actually have a, a, a visual presentation. I was just gonna make a few points before we head into, uh, or at least some, some observations. Um, unlike my old buddy, uh, Victor, who's a futurist and now a full-time filmmaker as well, um, I've only done three or four virtual meetings up until three weeks ago. Um, that hasn't really been my platform. I'm kind of a dinosaur when it comes to some of that. So this has been a real learning lesson or you know, series of learning lessons for me. So, um, and then we weren't sure if we were going to do this charrette last week or two weeks ago. So when it was all hands off deck, when we left the office, um, thinking back, I remember that I should have grabbed a few more things. So. Part of what I have to add to this, hopefully, is just um, some of my, you know, in the living room experience. Um, number one, I found that your, your mute button can be your best friend. And uh, when you're on a conference call with 35 people, you know, not everybody is interested in what you're eating for breakfast or, you know, what your kid's playing on the tuba. So it's always good to um, have some etiquette. And we're still sort of figuring out, you know, who should speak when so we're not all you know, talking on top of each other. I also find that you don't always have to be on camera. Um, in fact, you know, we work almost exclusively with local governments and not all of them are as, as tech savvy as those of you out there. Um, and they're not always comfortable being on the screen. So um, I think it's encouraging or you should encourage folks to participate visually as well. But um, I have found, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. And in fact, it can be distracting sometimes. Um, and as I said, not everybody's technically savvy. So this requires some patience. Um, we've had people you know, on their screen, on their cell phone, and on another device all at the same time trying to connect, creating this feedback loop. And you know, so weird things happen. We're all getting through this, um, but I think it does take a level of patience. And um, you know, in fact, many people um, prefer a phone call. I like what Victor said earlier about the the telephone town hall. Um, we do a lot of work in, in minority communities that don't have access to, you know, the computer set up at home and a telephone call is a great way to stay in touch still. 
What I found is that um, during our charrette or our workshops, going back to basics is, uh, was really helpful for me at least. Um, you know, we tend to talk with our hands a lot, uh, not just like this, but in terms of sketching and drawing ideas. And I find myself drawing things quickly, photographing them with my phone, texting them to my computer so I can email it to the county staff to sort of illustrate what we've been discussing for the last 20 minutes and nobody understands what we're talking about. So um, keep your pencil close. It's still your best friend. And um, it will help, I think, bridge the gap between the tactile, or as Victor taught me, between the digital and the um, whatever the other one is, analog. Um, also beware of your home outputs, especially if you're doing charrettes. I found this out the hard way. As I said, we sort of jumped ship out of our office and went to our homes and set up our, our, our gear. And um, when we started working on the charrette that Kim was describing, um, I found myself designing 1,200 acres at one to 2,500 scale on eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper with a magnifying glass, literally. So, because I didn't have the ability to print out at larger scale here at the house. So lessons learned, um, keep in mind, you know, how you're inputting and how you're outputting uh, when you're developing work at home. That's very important. As I mentioned, um, we do a lot of interviews with local governments and with, with residents. Um, I'm just reiterating the telephone is still actually a good tool. And um, I learned something new last week as well. Public hearings, of course, are becoming less and less, um, especially those that are not um, quasi-judicial or mandatory for, say, a, a county commission adoption hearing or something like that. Um, I discovered last week that I had to go to another county for a public hearing because they were not able to swear me in as a quasi-judicial hearing um, via you know, technology. So our cities and counties are, I think, doing the best they can to catch up. Um, but as Victor mentioned earlier, we're gonna have a lot of pent up public meetings, I expect, going forward. Um, and so, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, we're not sure how long this uh, sort of quarantine studio situation is gonna last. But um, I think as Kim said, everybody for the most part is being very gracious and uh, there are lots of ways to communicate. And my final point is get a good chair. I don't have one and I'm suffering for it. So get yourself a good chair. It'll make all the difference. Thanks. Hey, thanks so much, Dana. Um, uh, Margaret, can you unmute you? Yeah, yeah, thanks so much, Dana and Kim and Victor. We've got a couple of questions in, um, they're all really good. I'm gonna start with the one from Eric, um, that's the, which none of you have addressed, that some jurisdictions are still refusing to hold any public meetings because of the social distancing. Um, they've shared good practices like you all presented, but still no movement. So Victor, I know you, when you and I spoke, you were busily working with all of your clients. How did you get them to move beyond the crisis and to understand that this can be an appropriate means of communication? Well, first, uh, there's the one we did a couple of weeks ago. There's the one we're doing next week. And then there are the ones that come later. And they're all at different stages um, in that conversation. The one we did a couple of weeks ago was a matter of some urgency. And so I think our clients in Missoula who are probably listening right now have had a special motivation. They, they want to build grant. There's a lot of infrastructure that's going to be constructed under that grant. Uh, they're going to build that uh, street infrastructure with or without a good plan for what goes on around it in the Mullen area in Missoula. And so uh, this is the window of opportunity. They just had to do it now. So canceling altogether was a really unattractive option for them. So they were especially motivated, I think, to uh, be one of our first that took all these tools we're used to using, but putting them all together in one package. And I say tools we're used to using, you know, uh, we have uh, James Doherty, our director of design lives in Budapest. Uh, we have clients and collaborators at any given moment are spanning mm -hmm. across five or six time zones. So we are always doing this video conference thing and, uh, sharing back and forth electronically and trying to get rapid feedback um, and treating James like the morning shift. So he works on something that we need the first thing the next morning uh, since he's a few hours ahead. So that, that, that sort of distance work was already part of how we were working internally in the office. And for us, it was a matter of taking these multiple tools and that custom and 
turning it outward facing, doing it, letting it happen with the client that way. Uh, so we were ready to do it, and that uh, it makes going to take others. Uh, you know, we haven't been doing that sort of thing longer to, to adapt to it. Um, and so in in Missoula, they were motivated because they had they have a deadline and they had to get it done. So they decided to try it, and I think in the end they were very happy they did. Andrew Hagemeyer is a, a young uh, professional in uh, Missoula County. Um, made the comment as we were talking with the higher ups about this pivot to virtual. He said, "Oh, great! I like this. Now, finally, some people my own age will be able to participate in the meetings." And that is the inclusion theme that you were getting at uh, when you first brought this webinar up. Lynn. So I think they were there. Neptune Beach, it took a little while to think about it. Uh, and there were multiple conversations. Each began with, I think we should just put this whole thing on hold for now. And there's definitely a group in Neptune Beach was pretty skeptical about what's going to happen next week. And we're, you know, we, we have to earn their trust by making it work uh, next week. Uh, so the thing that made it, made it easy for them to decide in the end as the leaders uh, to go online was the prospect that over the coming year or year and a half, we may be ordered back inside to shelter at home multiple times. Um, you know, yeah. the idea that it's not just one curve we're trying to flatten, but it's a series of waves that are gonna go across the timeline where each time the number of cases starts to build up beyond or, or threatening the capacity of the hospitals, right. we're going to need to go back inside again and go back to sheltering and staying at home, social distancing. So if that happens, how can you schedule anything? Um, everything you were thinking, you just wait until a few months from now, you'll be able, or a few weeks from now, you'll be able to do it in a conventional way, could be suddenly rescheduled, just like the things we're talking about. Uh, so that, uh, in the end, was a reason for them to go on and get started. Um, that's, um, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Kim and Dana, what was your internal processes to decide to do the Port St. Lucie charrette virtually? And and again, what, how might you, did you have any pushback from the municipal officials in Port St. Lucie? Uh, you want me to take that, Dana, I'm guessing? Yes, please, go ahead and take that, Kim. Okay, sure. So, um, so I'll be completely honest. Uh, when, um, when the COVID-19 started to um, become more obvious, I did not think we were gonna continue forward with the virtual design process. So I, fully expected the city would say, let's wait, which would be disappointing because as I mentioned, you know, this is a city that, that rises quickly and falls quickly with every economic cycle. Um, it's the nature of a fast growth community like this one. Um, and the, the staff and the elected officials were adamant that they were gonna waste no time in getting their master plan figured out to be positioned to receive investment with both investors that are looking for deals in the down market and that's been happening i mean since the in the last three weeks there's more interest in some of the parcels the city owns this is city owned property that's being sold um so it's um so that was one kind of um um uh, corrected perspective which is i thought they might be cautious and say let's wait and instead they were like waste no time stay on schedule and we want to get we want you to give us you know your analysis as quickly as you can so we can we can be positioned to take advantage of the recovery um in fact i was on a call before this one with the city who is the same city who's now looking at a build grant to pay for one of the pieces of infrastructure and they're accelerating that as well so um so for the cities that understand how economic cycles work um i think they're going to be more aggressive um in this time um we have a second community that is in the same way, I thought they would delay um, a master plan effort and they're actually picking up the pace. So how did we react as a team? Um, we're a pretty flexible group and we're a well-oiled, we have a well-oiled team, which is, which is one of the real strengths. Um, so not only are we used to working together on shifting sand, because that happens when you're in the public meeting environment, um, but the team members that we assemble for these types of efforts know each other, they know how to work and we're used to working, you know, hours that don't make any sense, which is what all of us are doing now. Like day turns to night when you're working at home and it's 4.30 and you haven't had lunch and you wonder what happened. So um, this is what I'm finding. So, um, 
So I, I think having that internal flexibility let us respond to what the city was um, the city was looking for. Um, we and when we simply acquired the um, the meeting software that that most of the rest of the world has been using on a regular basis. So in some ways, the dinosaur approach that Dana mentioned, it's one we're guilty of. Um, we're used to being um, pulled into public meetings. You know, sometimes it's three or four nights a week, and now there are meetings that are moved to a virtual environment. But we're used to working in that type of schedule. So um, that's some observation. I don't know, Dana, you want to add more. It's harder on the design side than, than my well, side. I think that... Um... I think there was a sense of urgency with the Port St. Lucie project that Kim described, similar to the, the work that Victor is describing. Um, where I've encountered, and it's only been three weeks, where I've encountered any reluctancy, I think is where there are some local governments that aren't letting their employees, non-essential employees work at home. And I yeah. think there's still this sense that if you're quote unquote working from home, you're just eating chips and watching TV <laughs> and you know, that's what I was planning on doing. And it turns out, like Kim said, night turns to day, day turns to night. It's a very weird sort of, you know, anti-circadian thing that we're doing here. But I think that, you know, the work that we were able to do, and frankly, I was, I was skeptical. I told Kim, I said, I don't know how this is gonna work. But, you know, I haven't, like I said, I, I'm not, you know, as adept at some of the technical aspects as all of you are, but, um, but it did work. And in fact, as I talk to other local governments that are our clients, um, they're like, wow, that's interesting. So maybe we actually can advance this where we are really running into a lag. And I won't belabor this, but we've got one project in particular that has a very, very rigid approval schedule is where we're hitting the public hearings. And that's becoming, that's going to be, for us going to be, I think the charrette design collaborative thing is, I think we're gonna all figure out how to do that pretty well. But getting through the actual public approval process, local governments are still trying to figure that out. So thanks all. A lot of people wrote in about the equity issue, the digital divide, that some people have access uh, to the internet, to computers and other people don't. One tool that Victor talked about was town, the town hall method. Um, so Mark Fenton, hi Mark, um, would like some information. How was that marketed? How was the call list created? Had people expressed a willingness to be called? So what, what are some of the, like the logistical details in pulling that together? Um, it's an interesting thing. You know, it sounds so low tech compared to these fancy things where you have video screens and virtual whiteboards and all the other stuff. Um, just a phone call which you can take from a landline. You don't have to have a smartphone or a, even a cell phone to do it. Um, and, I, you know, I've only participated in one. So my experience is limited and we're experimenting with it again soon. Um, and the, the town set it up. Um, and I, that's how I found out about it. And they, they do them regularly in their town. So there are other communities who have systems like Everbridge that, that push recorded messages out and you can opt in to receiving your, the message as an email or a text or a recorded message on your phone, which is kind of interesting because it means that someone who doesn't read text or won't see that notification can ask to have their phone ring. So it's, uh, it's helpful for certain people with disabilities, for example. Um, so that's how I found, I found out about it. If you want to look it up, there's a really cool demo video on how a telephone town hall works at teletownhall.com, which is one of the vendors that does these things. Teletown Hall. Teletown uh, Hall. Teletownhall.com. So there's a bunch of questions. So I'm just going to try to um, ask you all to, to, to be a little bit more concise so we can get through them all. Um, uh, a number of folks have written in and, and said they understand how this could work from the consultants or the town's perspective. Do either of you have a have an antidotal story of what's it like from the participants' perspective? I mean, it's a little hard. You're asking to like work on walk in somebody else's walk in somebody else's shoes. But Victor or Kim or Dana, did anyone come and tell you, it's like, I was really unsure how this was gonna go, but once we got going, it, it worked fine. I felt like I could participate. Did you hear any stories like that? We've gotten a few uh, emails and text messages, uh, comments that were 
you know, sent into the website along the lines of what you described where people said, I wasn't sure how this was going to work, but I'm so glad you did it. Um, and I think one of the reasons why we haven't run into a lot of objection is because the, you know, the visioning phase where we're doing the design charrette, for example, is usually well in advance of the required customary official statutorily required public hearings that Dana was talking about. And so when someone says, well, what if every single person in the town doesn't participate? We say, well, wait, first of all, this is extra. This is, not the, this is not replacing your official processes. This is extra in advance of your official process to make them more appropriate because those formal public hearings, which are required by statute, different in every state, um, are typically pretty dysfunctional. You know, people have to figure out their positions well in advance. Um, maybe even file briefs if it's a particularly contentious case and there are court reporters sitting there and somebody's going up to the podium and they have one and a half or two and a half minutes. They haven't listened to anybody else who spoke and gave testimony before them because they're studying their notes, thinking about what they're going to say. Nobody changes their mind based on the evidence that's presented. It's just very dysfunctional. So our feel, you know, this is one of the reasons the charrette tradition emerged anyway was to get in advance of that process to get to answers for which there was more consensus. So that means that it's not replacing those statutory projects and everybody will still have the required reasonable opportunity to be heard. Um, in uh, some of our clients are more sensitive than others to uh, the civil rights concerns or to ADA concerns. So we've got some clients who are really good about uh, hiring sign language interpreters and uh, conducting multilingual meetings, for example. Uh, others that just that nobody's complaining, so they don't they don't do it. And I I think that we're going to see as more and more processes move online, we're going to see a lot more sign language translating. For example, just in a, an event like this one could have a sign a signing uh, window uh, in the corner, and it would add a whole group of people who don't know what we're talking about to the process. Same with closed captions. So. Um, extra in advance that's the solution kim do you have anything to add to that have you heard any feedback from your virtual participants um surprisingly positive across the board which um i mean like dana i think we're both cautious but you know when you're charged with a task you try to figure that out right so um so the feedback was remarkably positive uh, you know and, and and we have the benefit of being in a honeymoon time frame right now, <clears throat> where I think there's such a, a, a shock to the system that the work environment is giving people a sense of normalcy and a chance to escape whatever headlines you tend to see. Um, and so having a chance to work on a master plan for a future condition that you, you, you uh, and I think they always come from a basis of a better future, right? And some th th going forward um, gives an organizing framework for the way people think. I and mean, one of the ways I describe what we do at the Regional Planning Council is that we're kind of like, part of the job is we're always selling hope, right? I mean, that's just the nature of doing this type of long range planning. Um, and, so, and so I think that um, these types of efforts uh, again, we're in a honeymoon time frame, and so I'm very aware of that, um, where there's people are so grateful to have good projects to work on, right? Most people don't have anything to work on right now. And, it, and not only are we able to work on projects like this one, but work on projects that you enjoy and you believe in. So, um, so I'm, uh, I'm very aware of that as a person in this. Um, the folks that we've been participating with professionally, I think, appreciate that as well. Um, what I have found is um, everything takes a whole lot longer. Not a surprise, right? Because to set up a conversation about a stormwater pipe is, is a teleconference that sometimes takes five days to get arranged instead of walking to somebody's office and asking the question. Um, and so we have the advantage of being in a honeymoon, and I am engaging a lot more extensively with the, with the representatives that I'm working with because I want to continually validate what we're doing because that natural feedback loop is interrupted and it's shifted into this online environment. I mean, I will say going forward and to Victor's point, I mean, anyone that can pay attention to the, the science of our condition has to be aware that this isn't the only time we're gonna deal with this type of um, sheltering um, uh, directive. Um, and so 
I think becoming more comfortable and confident in how we conduct ourselves in a virtual environment will make us more able to do a better job with democracy as we go, because nothing that we're taking on now is a skill that we're going to lose, you know, when we go back to a regular meeting environment. I mean, what I envision is we're going to have a layer of go to meeting or zoom or whatever it is in whatever project we carry out going forward because we already know how to do it it's not that hard there's not a big cost differential it's another layer of coordination but you know we're 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 learning we're becoming more efficient as we go um and so extending the public's experience with that and their confidence in that process will make us a ab more able to continue forward when we have these other interruptions so and it's a when it's not an if you know there will be something else will happen Florida, by the way, we're used to dealing with hurricanes and economic cycles. So we're used to sheltering and then everything comes on hold for a while and then we start to hit a recovery. So there's some sense of this, although I'm not buying plywood and raviolios, which is often what I get for, um, uh, for hurricane prep. Um, it's a different type of prep this time, um, but it's, it has a familiar um, sense to it, at least what in the experience that, that I'm having and in how I interact with others, both professionally and personally. So there's a sense of familiarity that isn't necessarily comforting, but we have that in our frame of reference. And then we get back to normalcy again. So but we're always expecting, gosh, if you schedule a workshop in September, you might have a big interruption because we could have a hurricane that takes the power out for 19 days. So um, that's just perspective. Lynn, Victor? I don't yeah. think this is important just for dealing with our present emergency or the crisis uh, that created a sudden upwelling of experimentation uh, practical experience with uh, all of these tools and going online and doing video chat and all this stuff. Look, a lot of people that never work from home are getting their first taste of what it's like to do one of their days or three or of their five days of the work week or all of their days working at home. And so I don't think we're ever going back to what it was uh, with the everybody um, or so few people. Like telecommuters used to mean somebody who came to their boss and said to their employer, can I please work from home? And now a telecommuter is somebody whose boss just came to them and said, get out, go home, take your laptop, don't do that here. So, uh, so now we have a whole country full of professionals who are lucky compared to the people who have restaurant jobs or who are doing things yes. that are you know, completely on hold and certainly lucky compared to the overstressed healthcare workers uh, what should we be doing with this time? We should be working double time. We should be doing a lot more with the time we have because, uh, you know, our economy hasn't been as completely interrupted as, uh, say, the gig workers or the or the people who are uh, who are working in waiting tables or busting tables and doing all that kind of work, uh, who are just or, or working in retail whose whose jobs have just been put completely on hold. So therefore, we I think we have an extra obligation to keep it moving. But then when it's all over, when we can all go back to the office, we're not all going back. I mean, or at least we're not going all going back at the same time for the same hours and the same work week that we were before. And we're, when we don't have to use digital tools to make up for the fact that we can't have in-person public meetings, we're going to stop using the digital tools? Absolutely not. We're going to use them. And it's going to be a great addition. It's, you know, there were a lot of um, uh, people who gained skills in this crisis that are gonna still have those skills when it's over. So I don't, I think the world just changed. is isn't a matter of whether there's a virus. The virus is just a temporary situation that we're dealing with right now that has uh, caused this sudden skill building. But when it's over, people will still be using these tools. Um, Victor, Jeff Moen just wrote in and he said, again, this is a little bit of lemonade out of these lemons. Do you think it's possible to pull in a larger talent pool? I mean, that's yes. one, one thing that I've been thinking of. Sure. It's like, wow, you're no longer bounded by air fires, how far it is, et cetera. You're only bounded, frankly, around the time, the, you know, the time frame that, you know, we're starting at noon to accommodate West Coast people who's, uh, who get up around nine o'clock, right? Well, our, our buddy in Budapest is actually a night person. So <laughs> he works really, his time is actually pretty well overlapped with us. Um, but you're absolutely right. And, and yes, it's, it's already become an opportunity to collaborate with, uh, with some folks that, you know, in the past wouldn't be able to drop in on your project because dropping in on your project meant buying them an airplane ticket 
um, buying hotel room nights, mm -hmm. uh, subjecting them to endless uh, technical briefing and information and so on. Uh, and then if they missed something, you know, to spend a lot of time catching them up, now they can just drop in. I, you know, I'm attending uh, Monday morning meetings of our of our clients. Uh, I never got to attend their Monday morning meetings, but now I and now I can attend a Monday morning meeting with our client before I go into our Monday morning meeting, and I know what's going on in that city, and I have an idea of the of the state of play. I t was totally uh, unable to see except on the weeks when I was on the ground in that site. So I think you're right. Yes. We can both extend ourselves in ways that we couldn't before, and we can draw more people in, uh, including Jeffrey. Let's, uh, you're on, Jeff. Uh, that's a that's a great <laughs> suggestion. You're next. Lane, and if I could, uh, to... yeah, go ahead, Dana. I'm sorry, Victor. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, if I could add to that, I had an interesting experience yesterday working with a client, a local government, and they want us to do a whole series of things for them. And it's interesting because of the situation we're in now, um, the project may become more achievable for this local government because they're not having to pay airfares and hotel nights and things of that nature. So what I just discovered yesterday for the first time is that local governments might actually be able to pay for more of the work rather than the logistics, you know? That great? And, or, or make projects more available to smaller local governments that might not have been able to afford it otherwise. You know, charrettes have been like building Gothic cathedrals and big, elaborate, expensive undertakings requiring a vast staff. Uh, and, you know, and now we're like individual stone cutters cutting one piece each in our house, in our backyard. In our backyards and sending it off to be assembled in the uh, in the cathedral. I've, so the point is, we have to communicate with each other. If we do that, then we can work more individually and get a lot more people. That's the plan. I, you know, I, we got I don't think it's got to be. I don't think it has to be a negative. Why can't this just be a positive? Well, and we got a question from San Paulo, Brazil, who asked, "Do we think that this is a wave of the future?" Um, it, you know, to do both Definitely. virtual as well as in person. And what I'm hearing from all of you is absolutely, definitely. Yeah. Sure. Another, another international yeah. question came, um, I'm just trying to get through a few more of these that came in from um, Afghanistan, which was, do you think that it could work in countries, um, you know, very poor countries with not a lot of infrastructure, where charrettes are just beginning to emerge? And is it possible to leapfrog and to go to virtual? Okay, can I go first? A little trickier. I think that if you look at the project in Missoula, where we did their downtown plan last year and began the studies on the new site that we charretted for a week before last uh, at that time, we were able to do that because we knew that site. We had already established relationships with a lot of people there. We had already walked the land. I mean, we were familiar. And uh, so even though it's far from home, the people on our team had already been there. They, you know, Jason King from our office who led the Mullen area plan charrette for Missoula, you know, he, he's already got his own personal relationship with that river and with the land around it. And uh, so that, in addition to the interpersonal relationships made it possible for us to pivot and carry out that work. In Neptune Beach, we're halfway through a process that's already had numerous public gatherings where we've already done work in small groups. Uh, we've, met a lot of, we've met a lot of the people there. We've met stakeholders, had interviews. We've worked with school children uh, and their parents. So we, I feel like now just doing the next part of it online was an okay change. It's going to be much, much harder to do this kind of work for a place we haven't seen with people that we don't really know. And I, I don't wanna build any false expectations about that. I think, um, you know, it comes down to also, uh, because the public involvement aspect of a charrette is very appealing and it sort of looms large when you talk about the charrette, it kind of tends to take over and eclipse some of the other things about a charrette. The charrette is a collaboration tool. You know, the, the inclusiveness is the byproduct we said, well, if we're all going to be together and we're all going to be doing this thing, why don't we let the public come in and see us do it and even help us do it? Why don't we make it all visible uh, and throw the doors open? We're all here anyway, we're, and we're working interactively. 
Uh, and why don't we invite the media? Why don't we have the mayor walk through? I mean, and so forth. So the public involvement aspect of the design charrette um, in, the, in the classic charrettes was something we were able to do because of what we were already there to do, which was collaborate in high speed. And then the, on top of that, the work, final work product wasn't, here's, here's what the citizens said in the charrette. I mean, sometimes Treasure Coast likes to name the, the books, Citizens Master Plan. I love that, um, Dana and, and Kim. But, but, the, but really what we're presenting in the end is some kind of synthesis. You listen to the tech experts, you know, like the engineers and the environmental scientists, and you listen to the land, and you listen to the citizen stakeholders, and you also listen to all those things you can't help noticing yourself as a designer. Um, and then when you're done, you mash that together in a combination. You come back to your client and you say, this is a synthesis that includes the public uh, input where advisable. We've sorted it, recategorized it, adjusted it to make it work, but it includes the public input where advisable, but it also represents our best advice to you as your consultants and advisors. So, you know, we would stand behind this plan even, you know, as like this. And I think that's a little, that's an underrepresented or forgotten aspect of the charrette system that actually is key to making it work. Yeah. People if, aren't just I, being facilitated. They are, right. they are being interacted with by the designers themselves. You know, there's, if I could just really quickly, Lynn, um, Victor's absolutely right. I mean, we can be intoxicated and seduced by the technology and the fact that it actually worked. Um, but, you know, the projects that I've been involved with over the years that have been the most successful where you've got so many citizen champions of a plan or of an effort, they have built a level of trust in the work that the Charette team is doing. Um, by sitting by sitting next to them and chatting about their kids and watching us draw and you know talking about the art class they took when they were in school, so there's a relationship that's actually built with the team members in the community. If the charrette process and yeah, it's old fashioned, but I still believe in it a thousand percent. That I fear is is going to be something we're going to have to figure out. Yeah, well, I can't thank you all enough for joining us. Um, again, this is On the Park Bench, uh, presented to you by CMU. Um, this entire webinar will be available on our website um, as a recording posted in about 24 hours. Join us next Tuesday at noon, um, Lessons from the Recession. Um, again, we're trying to provide a platform for CMU members to talk about emerging issues. And with that, I'll let all the panelists give one final comment. So Kim, why don't you go start us off? Mitra, stay hydrated and um, and uh, <laughs> and and you know you got to keep a sense of humor with all this. So it, the, everyone is going through a tough time. It's not just us, the ones who are normally on the stage, but every person is going through a tough time. Um, and so you know where we're able to continue to and and, and I'll just I mean it might sound it it it, it, it isn't intended to be overly optimistic, but you know, we're in the world, we're in the job of selling hope for communities. That's what, that's what CNU has always meant to me and this master planning work has meant to me. Um, and we will get through this time. Hopefully we're a little smarter, we're more adept. Um, and, um, and this is a chance to try to figure out some better ways of doing things going forward. So it's, um, it's, it's dark, but there's sunlight it's always trying to get through even in a dark sky. So that's kind of my approach with this one also. Excellent. Dana, any final thoughts? Just uh, quickly, thank you, Lynn and Margaret and CNU for letting me participate with this incredible team. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, everybody stay safe. Victor, it's been too long. Maybe we can collaborate a little bit more digitally now. Uh, thank you very much. And Victor, why don't you close us out? Well, I think a lot of our clients uh, require uh, extra sensitivity from us, just like Kim was saying, because they're, they're asking, how can I think about planning now? And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get the park benches disinfected or, uh, or you know, get the lights back on uh, in some enterprise. So I think that the, of course, the answer is you should do it now just for all the reasons Kim gave. That's how you, that's how you're shovel ready. That's how you take advantage of the, of the of the recovery and you, you, you are part of it. Um, but I think also just being aware that everybody's pulled and anxious 
and pull in a lot of different directions. They're homeschooling their kid with one hand while they're they're uh, running their job. They're doing their job on the other. Uh, so extra patience, extra help, uh, help each other. Thank you all, Victor, Dana, Kim, um, and all of the participants we had today. We look forward to seeing you next week. So stay safe, uh, maintain social distancing, and we'll all get through this together. Bye, all. Bye.